So seriously, actually, we, we're, we're, we've, we're close to finishing um, the campaign, but we'd like to make sure that everyone would like to be part of it. I can see someone in the back. Who is that, Bill? Yeah. Yeah. Are we getting a bigger tour study room? Yeah. As a matter of fact, now that's, that's the third project. Hi, Josh. Good morning. Thank you, Josh. Did you tell everybody that you became a doctor? I became a doctor, yeah. Did everybody So if your education hurts, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, the, uh, the, the project has three parts. Part one is this new center out here, which we need for the families and kids and community, and there'll be a theater space. Part two will be a new entrance to the synagogue. So where the parking lot is at the front will become a park, actually a beautiful green space, uh, which you'll enter into, and then there'll be a lovely entrance pavilion uh, that you'll come in. So it'll feel, like, it'll feel like an entrance and not the back door, right? And then part three is we will remodel the entire sanctuary and the middle part of the synagogue will be taken out, and this room will be doubled in size. So there'll be a, a beautiful chapel with glass walls, and it'll seat 200 people. And on the upstairs, I'm going to fix this again because I'm getting good at it. Pardon me, dear. On the upstairs will be a center where we can keep Rabbi Showweiss's papers and books. So it'll become the Showweiss Center and the Weiner Chapel, and we'll have a lot more room. Okay. Good. Let's take a look together. Some years ago when we had a wedding anniversary, Nina and I took a little cruise in Tahiti. Anyone ever been to Tahiti? This is worth going as a cultural experience. It's a beautiful place. Just spectacularly beautiful place. So we, we take this cruise and, and the cruise consists of visiting five of the islands of the Tahitian <laughs> islands. And in one of the islands, one of the less developed islands, um, we take a jeep tour with a local, a local Polynesian fellow, spoke perfect English, very, very large man, uh, wearing a pareo, which is like a shmata around his waist. That's it. Everything else is, and, and, and flip-flops. But he spoke beautiful English. He's driving our jeep. He pulls into a valley, little valley. He says, okay, everybody off the jeep. So we all get off the jeep, and we're standing around him, and he says, I want you to look around at what you see. That's a papaya tree, that's a guava tree, that's a mango tree, that's a coconut tree, that's a pineapple tree, that's a breadfruit, that's taro, that's a grapefruit tree over there. He says, we have streams full of fish, the ocean is full of fish, you couldn't starve on this island if you tried. And it's all natural, it's all here. And every one of the islands is the same. And then he turned to us and said something so interesting. He said, I lived in America and in England for a long time. Your Western culture is based on an ethic of scarcity. You're worried that you don't have enough. So you hold on to what you have. And you guard what you have. And you're jealous about what you have. Our ethic is an ethic of plenty. We have plenty. We don't worry. Polynesian homes don't have front doors. And by the way, this is true. They put a shmata in front of the door to keep animals out, but there's no door, there's no doorknob, there's no lock. We don't have many words for possession. If you have something, the word in Polynesian for having it means you have it for the moment. You, but to own some, there's no word in Polynesian. This is what he told me. I can't vouch it. There's no word in Polynesian of owning something. It's yours for the moment, but there's no word for owning it. He says, you all read Margaret Mead. Remember Margaret Mead coming of age in Samoa? She said, Margaret Mead, says, that, that wasn't exactly the way it is. They're, they're, they're stronger family ethics, but basically she got it right. If one of our children goes off and gets pregnant, it's not a big deal because it's not a problem that there's another mouth to feed. And paternity doesn't have to be established because there's plenty of food. There's plenty of everything. We're not jealous of these things, of who's taking our what. He says that's the difference between you and us. And ultimately he says the difference between you and us is because you're so worried that you won't have enough, all you do is work. And you come here on vacation. And me, <laughs> I live here. <laughs> Get back in a Jeep. <laughs> now, think about what that is. It was such an interesting point of view. 
The philosopher Ludwig Feuerbach said very famously, you are what you eat. And he, what he meant by that was that the structure of an, of an economic system is determinative of an entire culture. If you begin with the premise of, I don't have enough, I won't have enough, I'm going to starve, then you build an entire culture based on that. What's mine is mine, and what's yours is yours, and keep your damn filthy hands off of what's mine. Right? You, you create an entire culture of front doors with locks and lights and burglar alarms. You, you build an entire culture of protecting mine, what is mine from what is yours, and dividing and this. You, you, if you start with the opposite premise, not with scarcity, but with plenty, then you end up in a very different cultural place. It's a, just a, it's an astonishing recognition, and you, and you can see it. Polynesians don't work too hard. All of the stores in Papatea are owned by the Chinese immigrants. The Chinese, now the Chinese work hard. So they came into, they, they run all the stores, they run all the businesses. The Polynesians, you know, they have a sort of manana ethic. We'll get to it tomorrow, there's no hurry. It's a very interesting sort of mix of cultures. Now, we're going to need to know that as you open the Torah today. Because today we're going to talk about sacred economics. The book of Leviticus, which is the middle book of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, is, is a book written by and for the priests of ancient Israel. The first 18 chapters are a handbook, a tech handbook for the sacrificial cult, the sacrificial worship. Translation. I did this before. Every, every profession has a technical handbook. Okay, if you go get your car fixed, and the mechanic doesn't know a lot about your Prius. What he does is go in the back and he takes out a book, it's a notebook, it's published by the Chilton Corporation, and it tells him how to fix a Prius. It tells him how to tighten things, how to loosen things, how, what are the gaps, what are the measurements to look for. Your mechanic has, it's called a tech manual. Your banker has a tech manual. If you go and open a certain kind of account, he, he looks at the tech manual to know how to format it. Lawyers have tech manuals. They know, how to, they know how to phrase certain kinds of pleadings and certain kinds of petitions in front of the court. Doctors have tech manuals. They know what kinds of prescriptions and, and diagno diagnostics to apply on kind of prescriptions. Rabbis have tech manuals. I have one. You get one when you graduate rabbi school. It has all the things you need to do. Funerals, weddings, brises, right? Baby namings, christening of tennis courts, things like this. And it tells you, here's what you should say, here's what you might say. Now here's what a tech manual gives you. It tells the professional how to do his job. It doesn't say why. That's why I went to rabbi school all those years. I know why you say this at a wedding or at a bris, because I studied all of the background stuff. The tech manual isn't about why, it's about how. The lawyer knows why the pleading has to be phrased in a certain way, because he went to law school and he knows all the case law that, that, that underlies that particular petition or pleading or, or evidentiary move or whatever he's going to do. But that's not in the tech manual. The tech manual just tells you, hang the tech manual just tells you how to, set, how to do it. So it, the first 18 chapters of the book of, Je, of, of Leviticus is a technical manual of the priests of ancient Israel. It doesn't tell them why. It just says, if the person comes and says, I want to offer this kind of sacrifice, here's how you do it. It's very dry. All tech manuals are dry, unless you're the guy who needs to do it. Unless you're the one leading. When I'm leading a wedding, I don't want the long discussion about why you say this under the chuppah. I just want to know what the hell I'm supposed to say. Okay? You get it? That, that's what the be Hang on a second. That's what the beginning... I'll get to you. That's what the beginning of the book of Leviticus is all about. So it's very dry. It's just the dry instructions to the priests about how to offer the sacrifices. Now here's the revolution. The revolution is that when the temple was destroyed in 586 BCE... And the, and, the, and, and the population of Jerusalem was taken to Babylon in exile, they brought with them the documents out of which they would form the Torah. Principally, they brought four documents. They brought the popular tradition from the northern tribes, that's called E. 
the popular tradition from the southern tribes, that's called J, the priestly tradition, which is called P, and the prophet's tradition, which is called D. They brought the priestly stuff and they decided to do something really radical, publish the priest's tech manual. Now think about that for a minute. Your mechanic doesn't show you where it says in the Chilton Guide that this is how you fix the Prius. Your lawyer doesn't show you where, what do you call it? What's the tech manual for lawyers called? <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah, you did, but there's a manual that you, the, the doctor doesn't show you. My, my daughter, my daughter's getting her, her, her PsyD, her PhD in psychology, so she has to memorize something called DSM-3. That's the tech manual for shrinks, right? If somebody comes in your office and threatens to shoot you with a 45, this is what you do, right? <laughs> He's probably depressed, you know, aggressive issues with his mother. You know, they don't show you that, but that's there. I mean, you can look at it. The, 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 the community decided to put the tech manual into the Torah because they wanted to say to us, from now on, all of us stand in the place of the priest. This was a very powerful political move, right? That's why the first 18 chapters of, of, of Leviticus are this sort of dry, dull instructions about how you offer the sacrifices and don't give you a lot of background stuff about why we do it. It's the last chapters of the book of Leviticus which are more interesting. That's the Torah of the priests. Uh, today, we're going to talk about priestly economics. Okay? Yes. This is going to be funny. I hope we appreciate it. Really short. Sure, I was in the law office of Janna Lowenstein. On a desk is a saying. Yeah. A good lawyer knows the law. A better lawyer knows the judge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a better, better lawyer knows what they don't know. That's really the point. <laughs> now, the priests of ancient Israel were the only tribe. The Levites became the priests. They were assigned... Levitical and priestly duties by Moses. Of all the tribes of Israel, the priests, the Levitical tribe, Levi Levites, were not given land. They were not given land. So we talk about the 12 tribes of Israel. There's actually 13 tribes because the tribe of Joseph was divided into two, Manasseh and Ephraim. They each got land. The Levites were not given land. The Levites were, were spread around the community to live in every community, in every village, in every place. And because they had no land, they had no means of support. They had to be supported by the populace. So the Levites are already living a very strange life outside of the economic life of the rest of the community. Right? Outside the, the life of the rest of the community. And from that perspective, they're going to give us a, an ethic of economics, which is going to seem very strange. What they're going to ask us to do economically in a certain way is to live their life. Having lived without means of support, the Levites discovered something. And, they dis and what they want to do to the economics is sort of what the beginning of Leviticus does to the Levitical tech manual. They, wanted, they want everybody to, to experience this. So take a look with me on page three, 738. Okay? Everybody okay so far? We good? Good. Ready? By the The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai saying, Speak to the Israelite people and say to them, When you enter the land that I assign to you, the land shall observe a Sabbath of the Lord. Six days you may sow your, six years you may sow your field, and six years you may prune your vineyard and gather in the yield. But in the seventh year the land shall have a Sabbath of complete rest, a Sabbath of the Lord. You shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. You, sh you shall not reap the aftergrowth of your harvest or gather the grapes of your untrimmed vines. It shall be a year of complete rest for the land. But you may eat whatever the land during its Sabbath will produce. You, your male and female slaves, the hired and bound laborers who live with you, your cattle, the beasts of your land, may all eat it. All right, what are we doing? So you're going to farm year one. You're going to farm year two. You're going to farm year three, four, five, and six. When it comes to year seven, what are you going to do? You're not going to, pl you're not going to plow. You're not going to plant. You're not going to harvest. What are you going to eat? Well, think for a minute. In year seven, you're going to eat the food that you grew in year six. six. The problem isn't year seven. The problem is year eight. What are you going to eat in year eight? 
what you're going to so what you're going to do is gather in whatever grows naturally on the field and store that up so that you'll have something to year, eat during year eight while the crop comes in from year eight. Okay? Get it? Yeah. Now, th what does this do to us? Let's just think this through for a minute because you'll notice there's an interesting quirk of the text. It says, you will eat whatever the land during its Sabbath will produce. You, your male and female slaves or servants, right? The hired and bound laborers. Doesn't say you. Doesn't say other people. It just says those people. Now that's a really interesting quirk of the text. Think about that for a minute. For one year, I can't plow, I can't plant, I can't irrigate, and then I can't harvest. I just take whatever the field gives me. Right? So does my. So do my employees. Okay. So what don't I do? I don't pay my employees that year. I can't. I got nothing to pay them. Right? I don't pay the employees. And, and what happens when it's time to go get food? We go out to the field together, me and my employees, and we all gather in the food. Can I tell the employee, go, go, go get that for me? Can I do that? No. Why not? Because technically the land doesn't belong to me that day. The land doesn't belong to me in year seven. It goes back to belonging to God. The lease sort of lapses. So in a certain way, not only does the, does the land get a Sabbath, everybody gets a Sabbath. What happens to the social hierarchy? It flattens. On year seven, everybody becomes equal. Everybody becomes equal, right? Me and the servant, my, I can't command the servant to do anything because it's not my land anymore. I can't tell him to go get it. It's not my land. And therefore, our economic relationship is suspended for a year. So for one whole year, if I say to him, go get me that apple off the tree, he can tell me to go to hell. He's my equal for that year. Just, just keep that in mind. Now, that sounds amazing, right? Yeah. Right now, if you want to see a little bit more about that, let's take one more peek at that from a different perspective. Okay, I'd like you to take a look at, wait, 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 I brought notes. This is a dangerous thing to do. Look at Deuteronomy 15. I'll give you the page in a second. Douglas is the best page turner in the class. Yeah, look at uh, 1076. Don't lose the place. Put a finger here and go to page 1076. Now that's the priest's idea. Deuteronomy is the prophet. Let's see what the prophet has in mind. He's even nuttier. Right? Every seventh year, you practice remission of debt. What? <laughs> you what? what? Remission of debt? What does remission of debt mean? I don't owe any more on the lease of my car. I mean, it's, on the, the mortgage is done. It's finished, right? This shall be the nature of remission. Every creditor shall remit the due that he claims from his fellow. He shall not dun his fellow or kinsman, for the remission proclaimed is of the Lord. You may dun the foreigner, but you must remit whatever is due from your kinsman. Now, you're going to say, really? <laughs> really? That's really what you're going to do? All right, come back to, Deut to Leviticus. So the, that's, we'll come back to that idea. Ready? Here's the nuttier idea. Here it comes. Ready? Because this is going to make all of you who uh, studied Milton Friedman. Remember Milton Friedman, right? Chicago economics, right? Anyone studied Milton Friedman, that's the, conservative economics, right? This is going to sound a lot like uh, Bernie Sanders, right? You shall, I didn't say that, I just written here. Right? You shall count off seven weeks of years. I'm on page 739, verse 8. Seven times seven. So that the period of seven weeks of years gives you a total of 49 years. Then you shall sound the horn loud. In the seventh month, on the tenth day, the day of atonement, you shall have, you shall sound, you have the horn sounded throughout the land, and you shall hallow the 50th year. You shall proclaim release throughout the land. Now, that's the, that's the verse on the liberty bell. It's not release, but liberty. The Hebrew word is drawer, which can mean liberty. In this case, it's a technical. That's why he translated his release. But if you take it out of context, it's proclaim liberty throughout the land. 
right? Ukratem dor va'aretz. Okay? You'll proclaim liberty throughout the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Now, the word jubilee is interesting. The Hebrew is yovel. So jubilee and yovel are simply the same word. Okay? Got it? Each of you shall return to his holding, and each of you shall return to his family. That 50 years shall be a jubilee year. You shall not sow, neither shall you reap the aftergrowth of harvest unction vines. It is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may only eat the growth direct from the field. So two things happened that year. The second thing that happens is that you're going to, remember, every seven years you have a Shemitah. It's called Shemitah. It's a Sabbath year, right? Got music in the air. It's lovely. <laughs> every seven year you you have a uh, if someone's every seven year you have a, a Sabbath year when you can't plow or sow or you just take from the field, right? You go seven years of se seven sets of seven years, and in the fiftieth year, what do you do? You have another one. So you pl you you plant and grow in year six, right? You don't grow in year seven. And then you don't grow in year eight, which is the 50th year. Everybody got that? So what's your question going to be? What am I going to eat? <laughs> like, what the hell am I going to eat? Go That's to the first... What? Go to Tahiti. Go to Tahiti, right. <laughs> That's exa You got it, Mel. You got it. <laughs> Listen, I, I've told you many times, don't go to Hawaii. If you want to keep faith in the God of Israel, don't go to Hawaii. Because you will do what I did. Nina schlepped me to the top of Maui Mountain. And we stood at the top of this big volcano, right? And you look down at this crystal clear blue sea. And these beautiful white sand beaches. And as much as you can see, these gorgeous people are wearing almost nothing. And you say to yourself, you turn your eyes toward heaven. And you say, Rebani Shalelam, you knew about this place? <laughs> And you put us where? <laughs> you put us in the godforsaken worst neighborhood in the world full of hilarious? It was going to take 40 years to get someplace. You could have brought us here. I could see it now. You have Oahu, Lanai, Kauai, and Alavai. <laughs> the Jewish island. And we would have run around almost naked. We would have eaten coconuts, you know. It would have been so bad. It would have been so bad. You know, I'm like, what were you thinking? Right? God was not happy with that question. All right. So the 50th year, you're, you're also not going to farm. And then the 51st year, which becomes year one all over again, what, I mean, this, is a, this is a serious question, but there's even a crazier idea. What does he mean when he says, each of you returns to his holding? Now remember, there is a theoretical year zero in this economy. Theoretical, right? In year zero, the tribes arrived in Israel, and Moses and Joshua divided up the land, and every tribe got land, and every clan, every family within every tribe got land. Then in the intervening years, we swap land. You sell your house, I buy a house, I buy an apartment, I buy this, I buy... Right? Every 50 years, what happens? You go back to go and get $200. <laughs> Every 50 years, you wind the economy back to zero. I mean, just think about this. Everybody takes all of their wealth and pushes it into the board, and we redivide it up. <laughs> we redivide. No, seriously. Think about this. Donald Trump, however much he has, we don't know, of course, but however much he has, he pushes it into the middle of the board, right? Warren Buffett pushes it in the middle of the board. We take all of the accumulated wealth of the country, push it in the middle, and then divide it equally among the citizens of the country. And everybody starts all over at zero. How's that? If you live in Beverly Hills, you go back to Boyle Heights. <laughs> I'm serious. Everybody goes back to where they started from. And you start over again with land. Which means what? Just think about what are the what, first of all why and so and how and what and what are you talking about? Now, by the way, even the Torah is going to say, "Yeah, pretty nutty idea, huh?" Look at the next line, right? In the year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his holding. When you sell property to your neighbor, 
or buy any from your neighbor, you will not wrong one another. <laughs> Tell me the Torah doesn't know Jews, right? Because the Torah knows what you're thinking. The Torah knows what you're thinking. You come to me and you're 48 and one alone? What am I going to do? I'm going to write you a two-year loan at 99% interest, right? Right? You, you will not, in buying from your neighbor, you shall deduct only for the number of years since the Jubilee. Right? So in other words, when I, buy, when I buy a field, I don't really buy the field, I'm leasing it, but I'm only leasing it for the number of years left until the Jubilee when it goes back to its original ownership. So nobody owns anything. Everything is only leased until the Jubilee when we go back to year zero. And in selling to you, he shall charge you only for the remaining crop years. I mean, what are they doing here? Why are they giving us all this detail? This is very unlike the Bible. Usually, this is the job of the Talmud to give us detail. But the Bible knows that you're saying, what? So he's giving you the details so you can start to figure out what would this mean. The more such years, the higher the price you pay. The fewer such years, the lower the price. For what he is selling you is a number of harvests. He's not selling you the land itself, he's only selling you the usufruct rights, the, the right to use the land. Do not wrong one another. That's the second time he's said it. And he's only saying it to you because he knows that this is just difficult. Because what's going to happen is if you come to me in year 47 and you want a loan, I'm going to say, to hell, I'm not going to give you a loan. I'm not going to lend you money because in three years you're gonna, it's going to be canceled. You're not going to pay it back. But fear your God, I am the Lord. And then he goes on and says, <laughs> you shall observe my laws and faithfully keep my rules that you may live upon the land in security. The land shall yield its fruit and you shall eat your fill and you shall live upon it in security. And should you ask, and this is really Talmudic. I mean, this is, well, that phraseology, should you ask, right? You didn't hear that in the Ten Commandments, right? Right? God says, thou shalt not murder. You didn't say, and should you ask if it's in self-defense? Does it come? Yeah, doesn't say that. But here, they know they're offering an idea, which is just wacko. It's wonderfully, deliciously wacko, but it's wacko. What are we to eat in year, what are we to eat in year seven if we neither sow nor gather crops? I will ordain my blessings for you in the sixth year, so that it shall yield a crop sufficient for three years. Well, wow. well, now think about this for a minute. You think that's really going to happen? It's only in your attitude, right? If you know that you have two years, if not or three years coming, where you're not going to be sowing, so what are you going to do? In the previous seven years, you're going to stock up. You're going to do what, what, what Joseph did in Egypt, right? This is not really, this is not going to change the weather or the fertility fields. This is going to be your attitude, which means... You're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to spend money and you're going to manage your own sustenance in such a way that you can get through these years. Right? And by the way, I bet you could. I bet you could. I mean, seriously, I bet, you, I bet if I told you that next year you'll have no income, but I'm going to give you a whole year to prepare, you could figure it out. You could work. So, you know, you'll cancel cable TV. <laughs> and you'll live without cable TV, and you won't go out to eat so much, right? And you'll drive one car instead of two, right? You'll start taking the bus. I bet you would, I mean, think about the changes in behavior that would come if you knew this was going to be the case, right? I will ordain my blessing for you in the sixth year. When you sow in the eighth year, you'll still be eating old grain of the crop. You'll be eating the old until the ninth year, until the crops come in. But the land must not be sold beyond rec reclaim, for the land is mine. You are but strangers resonant with me. Throughout the land that you hold, you must provide for the redemption of the land. Ge'ula, the three words at the end of that sentence in Hebrew are quite beautiful, right? Ge'ula titnu la'aretz. Ge'ula titnu la'aretz. I'm surprised that no environmental organization has taken that as a theme. Ge'ula means redemption, salvation. Saving, uh, rescue. You will give the land redemption. Now, well, they, they, what are they worried about? What's the motivation for this? What's the motivation for this? Poverty. What? Poverty. poverty. So one motivation for this is poverty. What's the problem with poverty? The problem with poverty is not somebody who goes broke. The, pro the problem with poverty is someone who goes broke in generation number one. 
and raise his children in generation number two wanting, without, needy children, right? And that generation raises children, needy children. What happens to a population that is impoverished into the third generation? You have something that we call in America systemic poverty. What is systemic poverty as opposed to plain old poverty? Plain old poverty is my grandparents. They had very little, but they knew they could work hard and make it. So they were prepared to make sacrifices so that, so that my parents and, my, and their grandchildren, their, their children and grandchildren could have what they never had. You go to UCLA, go to the library at UCLA, and you'll see who sits in the library at UCLA. Asian kids, who, or the children of immigrants who run little stores all over Monterey Park, because that they know that if they sacrifice, their children will achieve what they never had a chance to achieve. That was us a couple of generations ago. But the problem is, the problem is when you get into the second and the third and the fourth generation, you lose that faith. That faith that if I sacrifice, I can do better. And if a kid decides that I can make more money as a drug dealer or as a pimp, than I can as a college student, what do you end up with? You end up with an urban hell. If I can make more money robbing and stealing right, than I can by sacrificing and working hard, you end up with urban hell. You end up with a very difficult situation. So this question of systemic poverty. So if you figure, how long does it take to get three generations to about 50 years? So every 50 years, what happens? You wind the economy back, and no one falls into systemic poverty. That's one of the motivations. Yes, please. I was just going to say, it's a diminishment of expectations. Yeah. A diminishment of hope. I want to go deeper than that. You're an educator. You appreciate this. It's a diminishment of humanity. It's a diminish. If a person doesn't have faith that I can do better, or that my kids can do better, if a person loses the faith that if I sacrifice, my kids will do better than me, then what happens to them? What happens to family life? What happens to the inner life of that person? What happens to the culture of that community? It ends up being warped. It ends up being warped. Look, you, you, you taught for all those years. The whole, the whole ethos of education is a deep faith that I can change tomorrow by changing these kids today. Right? By investing in these children today, I can change tomorrow. The moment you lose that faith, the moment you lose that faith, you lose something very precious to being a human being. Right? This is, by the way, I might get political again, but this is the, the big question about inner city schools. Right? It's, it's, it's not charter schools versus public schools or private schools or Catholic schools. It's a question of whether the school has a culture that by working hard at school, you can do better than your parents did. And sometimes, the, you, the, because, or the, whether the culture of a bad neighborhood seeps its way into that school and the kids t say, to hell with it, I'm out of here as soon as you let me get out of here. <clears throat> I'm dropping out. <clears throat> the problem with high school dropouts is that they've lost the faith that, that by working, by applying themselves, they can, as it were, better themselves. You know, we, <laughs> I was living in Texas. When I was living in Texas, there was a big argument about whether kids who don't pass classes should be permitted to play football. Because in Texas, football's God. <laughs> right? It was called no pass, no play. <laughs> And I said, in my house, it was no A, no eat. <laughs> I mean, the pass? Pa I came home with a C in a class once. I, like, I, I, it was like castigation. Out, out of the house. You know? You know he said, no pass, no, but what do you mean? Because, like, you know, children of Im the, the immigrant child is told. You understand that in the early part of the 20th century, there were riots on the Lower East Side as immigrant mothers struggled to get their kids into New York City public schools, and when the school said the school's full, we don't have room for your kids, these mommies rioted in front of the school, they had to send the police down. But that was, the, when that's, the, that's a community that may be living in poverty, but is not an impoverished community. 
It's when you lose that. That's when you have an impoverished community. So there is a human effect to that. There's something deeply human about, there's something deeply degrading and broken about that. That's one of the things that the priests of Israel are worried about. Okay, Pop, Ronnie, and then someone else had a hand up. Yeah. raised on the slogan, yeah. what the mind lacks, the back will have to make up for it. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that's true, yeah. That's true. There was a, can I tell the story? I, I dropped out of college once. No, listen, I broke up with a girlfriend. I had a really bad time in a philosophy class. I was sick of it all. I got in my car. I drove home. My pop comes home from work. He sees me and says, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm going to take some time off. I'm having a hard time. He said, okay. I said, you're not mad? He said, no, no, it's fine. It's okay. I said, good, great. Three o'clock in the morning, he bangs on my bedroom door. And he says, I said, what, the, what are you doing? He says, get out of bed. I said, what do you mean get out of bed? He said, you're not going to go to school. You're going to work. <laughs> right? Get out of bed. Now, I had a job at the shop. My father owned a bakery, right? And my job, whenever I wasn't working, whenever I was in school, was I was the washer. I washed pans. So he, 3 o'clock in the morning, I put on some jeans and a t-shirt. I go to work. I put on my apron. I take my station at the sink, right? 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, the bread men finish their shift. All of these dirty trays and kettles and rotors come my way, and I have to wash them and have them clean before the cake guys come in at 5. So I wash all these pans, all these kettles, all these groters, all these trays. They're all ready. The cake guys say, hey, Ed, how are you? I mean, I knew all these. I grew up with these guys, right? They do their thing. All of them come back to me by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's when the decorator, when Norbert needs everything. So everything gets washed a third time, second time, and it's all ready for another. And, every, and then by 6 o'clock, I finished. I'd done it three times. Everything was washed. I swept the shop. I cleaned off the benches. Pop said, you coming back in tomorrow? <laughs> I'd worked from 3 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock at night with a half hour lunch break. I said, I think I'll go back to school tomorrow. <laughs> he said, good. He said, good. Let's see, 13 hours at $3.25 an hour. He said, he gave me 50 bucks. He said, this ought to cover gas and a pizza on the way home. I said, <laughs> I gave my father a kiss. I got in the car and I drove back to Spinoza, <laughs> you know, and, and philosophy. That, that, that was the philosophy that I grew up with, right? That was, that was that's, you know, that's, that's how it works, right? Okay, Ronnie. These rules in here yeah. are quite hard. Yes. Do we know if the population abided by these rules? Yes, the answer is no. <laughs> you can't keep these rules. You can't keep, number one, the Shemitah year is very hard to keep because it's very hard to say to a farmer, don't farm the field. Now, remember what they're talking about here. The, the, there is a practice in farming, even contemporary farming, of letting fields lie fallow. But what you do is you rotate them. You rotate them. So this field is lying fallow. I use my other fields. But they're not talking about that. They want all the fields in the whole country to lie fallow. And what, you, that's very hard to do. That number one. Number two... The Yovel, the Jubilee, impossible. it's impossible. First of all, who can remember what they owned 50 years ago, right? Who has the deed? But, but more than that, the whole idea that you wind an economy back. But, but, but understand what the priests were trying to say here. Number one, as you said, it's, it's an attack, it's, it's, it's a way of coping with the prospect of poverty. Number two, as you said, it's a problem of the humanity of the poor, right? And the third thing, and this is very subtle, and, and the third thing is, it's a, it's a direct attack on capitalism. And the attack on capitalism is, it's trying to get you away from the idea that you are what you own. That the dignity that we gain in the world from our possessions. You know, the, the notion that, that I, I define myself by my wealth, or I define myself by my acum, acumen and gather, it's a different way of understanding being human. But it's the priest's idea. Remember who the priests are. They own nothing. They walk among us and they own nothing. They depend upon the community's largesse, but they own nothing. And so the priests are worried as they see us struggling, struggling, struggling to make livings, the priests are worried about what that's doing to us. So what does the priestly tradition want us to do? Once, once every seven years, stop earning and live. 
Right? Once every seven days you stop earning for Shabbat. Once every seven years you take a year's sabbatical. Once every 50 years you give up everything you own. Every, everyone becomes equal again. Everyone becomes one, one again. There's a certain solidarity in all of this because we all give up all of the social hierarchical positions we've taken and we all go back to zero again. Right? It, 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 it's, an, it's an impossible... And, and it's completely contrary to the ethic of the harder I work, the more I get. Right? So my parents founded a kibbutz. And I used to go visit the kibbutz when I'd visit Israel. And over the years, I don't know if you've been to Israel lately, but all the kibbutzim are gone. And I remember, I, I saw it happen. I saw it happen. We were staying in... Some kibbutzim have a hotel. Kfar Bloom is the most famous one. So the hotel at Kfar Bloom, right? So we had a I had a group. Some of you were there. We we met we met with the maskira of the kibbutz, and she and and, and he was he, the maskira of the kibbutz. And he was telling us what happened. You know, the the way they worked is that the, the your work assignment on the kibbutz is assigned to you, but nobody wanted to work in the hotel, so they had a lottery, and whoever got chosen had to work in the hotel, right? Everybody was equal, right? And then somebody had the idea of, if I work in the hotel, pay me a little extra. And that was the end. Because the moment you become, pay me a little extra, that's the end of a, of a collective economy. Right? I think that what's going on here is a sensitivity to what capitalism does to us. It can't be, and, and it's not just what capitalism, it's that part of us, the, the earning, striving part of us. That's what they're worried about here. Okay, these are all the themes that are embedded in this, right? What does it mean to be able to see a human being and see past their possessions, their wealth, their power, and see the sanctity of that human being? Well, one of the ways of doing that is by removing people from the economy altogether. And that's sort of what this is. Billy. Do you think that this having, uh, correlating to the owner is an attempt to raise our holiness? not only underscoring the Omer, but also this uh, 49, seven years uh, cycle as well? The seven years is a tip-off of holiness. That's the, the seven, seven is the language of holiness. Seven times seven is the language of extraordinary holiness. So the Omer period is seven times seven, and you're right, this comes right in the middle of it. I think that's a, that's a purposeful kind of a overlap. Okay, but the Omer isn't anything like this. This is something very different. Yeah, please. Do you think that this is advertising colonists and then the people lose their I mean, the motivation to work hard because at the end of the seven years everybody gets equal? And that's why the communist countries go, you know, no well, So So that's the other side of the argument. That's exactly right. The other side of the argument is if you, if you are trying to remedy the, um, the acquisitive part of human beings, if you go too far the other way, you lose initiative. That idea that if I work harder, I'll make more. That the, 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 the motivation to work harder. Again, I used to work in the kibbutz, right? So if you're a volunteer in the kibbutz like me, you get up at, uh, at four, you have a cup of tea, you go out and you work till eight, and then you stop for breakfast for half an hour, and then after half an hour, you go back and you work till 12. That was, that was my shift, right? So you get to breakfast, and we're, we're, it was a wonderful social thing. So we all gathered in the dining room for breakfast, right? And I'm working with this one particular guy. We're working avocados, working bananas, different parts of the... And, and, and there's a guy there who works in one of the other areas, right? And the kibbutznik is... I always sat with the kibbutznik because I speak Hebrew, and he said to me, hey, that schmuck, he says, you come back in an hour and a half, he's still sitting there with his cup of coffee. <laughs> Even in the kibbutz, which t taught collectivism, there were people who worked harder than other people. And the people who worked harder resented the people who didn't work so hard. Right? And that, and that becomes a problem. That, that's the downfall of a collective economy. Because if you don't have a sense that I'm working for the collective, you try to spend another hour drinking coffee looking busy in the dining hall while everyone else is schwitzing out in the fields. You get the picture? And so that's exactly one of the, that's one of the problems. Right? So, you know, so China has presumably in a collective economy, but they've made so much room now for, for free enterprise that you now have this, you know, this sort of hybrid economy because there has to be room for that. The Torah is worried about one of the problems. 
The Torah is worried about the acquisitiveness of human beings. And so it gives us this ethic. Eli. Um, okay, so at some time, these words of Leviticus were written down by some people, and didn't they look around and say, hey, this isn't happening at all? Yes. So why do they write them down? Come on, tell me why. Sometimes you write things down not because you think it's ever going to happen. But you write things down because you want to present an ideal. Right? An ideal. Okay? I don't know when this was written, under what circumstances, but I think that what you have here is an, it's, it's an ideal situation. Look, it's the Garden of Eden. What was the Garden of Eden? God says to Adam in the Garden of Eden, everything you need is right here. You don't have to work for any of it. Right? I'm giving you enough. Just enjoy being. Right? So, so the question here is, I, I think that what the priests are trying to do is to, is to allow us for a moment to imagine what it would be like to have a priestly society where, like the priests, none of us owned anything. Where, we was, where there was a, a slight gap, a breath, between us and our property. That our property doesn't define us. And the acquisition of property doesn't define us. And the stretch, the straining to make a living doesn't define us. But like my, my, my Polynesian friend, we took a breath and say, look how much we have. I, it's a, it's a, I think it's an ideal without necessarily needing to, its own fulfillment. Right? Let's take a look for a moment at some of the reflections. Did I miss somebody back here? I, I, have, I just thought that this made it. It's been 50 years as a generation. Yeah. Yes. Um, as opposed to which is right. Everyone goes back to zero and starts all over again. Right? Everyone goes back. So you don't have accumulated family wealth. Exactly. Right? You don't lose that right. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Give me, give me your question again. It doesn't say family. It says your laborers. Yeah. The, the, my question is, can you expound on the, the, the idea that we're supposed to re, re, remain responsible for our servants and slaves during those years of, of the years? Yeah, I, I think that what you're supposed to do is, I think that you're supposed to, I, I think that what happens is if I don't define myself by my economic power, then my servant or my slave doesn't, isn't owned isn't in, in a certain way not employed. We become a collective. But you have to maintain your response. Like, they didn't fire them, they didn't let them go. I'm not sure. I'd say, what happens if I lose the land I'm living on, do I also lose the, the, con the contracts that I have with all my laborers? I, I think that that's what it implies. I think what it's going to imply is that at that point, everybody goes back to being a free agent in the society, so that you have a social hierarchy which collapses. Laborers and landowners become equals that year. In the seventh year, they become equals, and in the 50th year, they become equals forever. Right? In the, see, in the, presumably in the seventh year, they become equals, but in the eighth year, we resume farming. They resume their, their contract with me, but in the 50th year, they're, they're canceled forever. So, and I think that the idea is that you're, this is the, the Torah's way of completely addressing social and economic inequality. Because it equates social and economic inequality. The fact that I have more money means that I can command all these people to do this stuff, and I begin to feel myself as their overlord. Remember, the whole narrative structure is I came out of Egypt to know this, right? It's, it's trying to eliminate the pharaoh complex, as it were. So if once every seven years my laborer and I become equals, Say what? Herds of animals. Yeah, well, then I got to figure out how to take care of the animals. Yeah, that tells them. I think you go, to, let them go free. I think that's how you do it. No. One last. Do I have to feed my dog? That's the question. <laughs> yeah. What? Right? Yes. yes, please. Yeah. The three concepts: jubilee, everything, and God have the same gematria numerology. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So you look at. Yovel, yeah. which is the 10 from the Yud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's the gematria of Yovel? Yeah. Condenses down to 1. 
And if you look at Hakol, which is everything, yeah. also the hay, the calf, and the lamb, also comes <coughs> one. Yeah. And Hakadosh. Why do I use Hakadosh? Because Beth Migdash is named after our God. Yeah. Hakadosh. So yeah. Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Okay. Hakadosh also is one. So it just shows that from numerology, if you want to prove that there's a huge significance in having a jubilee that for everyone is the same, it's all everything, it's all all, all yeah. encompassing, right. and Hashem, because Hashem is ultimately why we're doing this. Yeah, yeah, if you live, I mean, the, 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 the presumption here is you're living with a God who is very much present in the experience of the community. And in a certain way, I mean, I put this blank, you know, much more, much more bluntly, you, you, you worship God more than you worship money. That's the notion here. Right? I'm more concerned about getting God right than getting my, my bank account right. That's what it's trying to say. Myra? In this case, it isn't only the economics that's addressed. It's the dignity of man where right. everybody is equal as human relations yeah. as well. Yeah, see, that's what I said at the very beginning. When Feuerbach said you are what you eat, and what he meant was that a structure of economics yields a whole structure of culture. So this reflects a notion that if I mess with the economics, I can mess with the, I can change the culture. And I'm trying to preserve and protect the sanctity of human pe persons. And the sanctity of human persons, I can't address that without addressing the economics of a society. Now in America, we resist that, right? In America, we push back very hard against that because we have a very, very strong notion of individualism. And that government shouldn't intervene and take too much of my stuff. Right? And that government is always the problem. And that's an American ideal. Right? That's an American kind of attitude. So income inequality becomes an, a very hot political issue. But the problem that America struggles with is this problem of systemic poverty and the indignity of living under those circumstances. And, and, the, 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 you know, and, and that's been one of our great national debates since the 1960s. Take a look at page 247. I want to take a look at two more reflections on sacred economics, and then we're going to call it a day. Okay, 247. Prophet Amos. Prophet Amos was a farmer, uneducated, country bumpkin, tall, bald guy wearing overalls. He lives in the South, so he talks like a Texan, goddammit. And he, owns it. he comes up to the North, to Samaria. And in Samaria, Samaria was a beautiful town. I mean, Big avenues, palaces, monuments, right? And he starts preaching on the corner. People come by and start listening to him. And he starts preaching and he starts preaching and he has this little riff. I didn't get, they didn't give us the first chapter, but in the first chapter, he starts talking about for three transgressions of the Amorites and for four transgressions of the Moabites. And, and then he starts talking about Israel. And he's preaching about what we see around us. Listen to what he says. For three transgressions of Israel, for four I will not revoke it, because they have sold for silver those whose cause was just. And the needy for a pair of sandals. That's a great scene. That's a great phrase. The needy for a pair of shoes, right? I was just in New York, and we were walking on Madison Avenue. And you can buy a pair of shoes that are... A family of four could live on for four years. I mean, <laughs> Jimmy Chu, is that who his name is? Yeah, I, I should make as much as Jimmy Chu. Oh, my God, right? You who trample the heads of the poor into the dust of the ground and make the humble walk a twisted course, father and son go to the same girl and proclaim and thereby profane my holy name. That's a very interesting phrase, right? But first of all, Amos is a village guy. I say village people, but that sounds like... Well, uh, in a village, everybody knows each other. You can't have prostitution in a village because everybody knows your mother. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> what do you, you know, everyone knows. That, but in a city, you can have urban anonymity. And in urban anonymity, you have people who drop out and become anonymous. So you have this kind of, uh, this kind of degradation of the urban setting. And, and you have the problem of, of poverty. So a woman who needs to make a living sells her body. 
And if the family's in particularly bad shape, she sells her daughter. And a father and son go to the same girl. I mean, the, the kind of indignity, the sort of the, 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 the brokenness of a society he's trying to capture in one phrase, right? You know, for your bar mitzvah, he brings you to a hooker. You know, like, you know, it's, just, it's like the worst, the worst indignity of human beings takes place. And it's happening in a, in a wealthy city. It's happening in a city with broad avenues and beautiful palaces and gorgeous public art and fountains. This gorgeous, gorgeous white marble city and in the midst of it is this urban evil, this deep urban evil. And here's what he's saying to the people. To live in a city like that, you learn to overlook the evil. And by the way, this is true. Every city has a certain level of evil which all of us have become inured to. We don't see it anymore. The guy sleeping under the bridge at the freeway on ramp, we don't see him anymore. The family begging, we don't see him anymore. The public hospital waiting room, I don't have to go there anymore. I have my own, you know. We don't see it. It becomes invisible to us. <coughs> to live in a city is to live with a certain degree of evil that you don't see. Now, the way you see it, by the way, is if you travel. I know if you ever travel and you go to other places and you see things and you go, oh my God. I, we were in Rio, which has got to be the most beautiful city on earth, Rio de Janeiro. I mean, gorgeous city. But there's this whole part of the city called the favelas. You know, this is brutal poverty. And you have to see it because you have to take the streetcar and it goes away. You can look down. They built a streetcar over the favela so tourists wouldn't have to see the poverty. But you see it, and you say to yourself, what? But the people in Rio don't see it. That's the, they live this, you know, they don't, we do the same thing. We don't see it. Amos, because he comes from a village where everyone is careful, he sees it. And he says to us, what's wrong with you? Open your eyes, look. Look at what you've done to these people. Look at what you're doing to these people. How do you judge the beauty of a city? You know, friends come from the East Coast. We take them to Disneyland, you know? We take them to the Getty. The, the beautiful thing about the Getty is this beautiful place. I mean, the, the art is good, but the gardens are like, and the view. But from way up there, you can't see anything bad. Like, you can't see South Central from the Getty. Right? And nobody has friends who come from Boston or New York or Detroit. Exactly. Guess where I'm going to take you? <laughs> right? I'm going to take you to Compton. <laughs> you know? We're going to go see. We're going to go see. You know, Locke High School. We're going to. We're going to go see Urban Blight. How would that be? <laughs> would you love that? No. You'd rather go to Disneyland. You know? Even Disneyland. Like you go to Disneyland, you walk into Main Street, USA. <laughs> right? There's no beggar. I, I, if, if Disney were really smart, they'd have like, you know, they'd have like, like, like homeless people sleeping in the doorways of Main Street, USA, you know? But of course, that's not what it is. It's all clean and bright, and you can eat off the ground, you know? Everyone's so sweet and happy, right? It's a small world after all. The happiest place on earth. But now, look, so what, what is Amos telling us? Open your eyes. So this is the same, this is the prophet's voice, and, 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 and the prophet's voice is different than the priestly voice. But what's happening in our Parsha is that the priest is taking on the radicalism of the prophet. And this is their, their stab at, at, the, at a radical solution to the same problems that the prophet sees, right? Let's finish it with me, right? They recline by every altar on garments taken in pledge and drink in the house of their God, wines bought with fines they imposed. We used to play a game. We used to play a game when I was a kid. What's the worst sin you can commit? Oh, I don't know. Eating a ham sandwich on the bima on Yom Kippur, you know, while making illegitimate approaches on the sisterhood president. I, you know, like, what's the worst thing you can do? For, this is what Amos is imagining. And, and, and what he's imagining, by the way, is that this is taking place under the sanction of the religious authorities. They recline by every altar on garments taken in pledge. You're not allowed to take a poor person's garment because it's what he wears. It's the shirt off his back. So these people 
have dunned the poor and they take their garments and they go to the altar where you offer sacrifices and they have picnics at the altar using some poor guy's you know, garment as their ground cloth. You, you get the picture? Like, how bad could it be, right? That's what he's looking at. And he's screaming at these people. Wine bar, yet I destroyed, and, he, and what he's predicting is that this is going to bring down the society, which eventually it did. Which eventually it did. What we have in our Torah portion is the priest's attempt to respond. It's the priestly attempt to respond to Amos's outrage. Because Amos, by the way, attacked the priesthood. And I think that what we have in the Torah portion is the priesthood saying, you know, you're right. So let's think about how to do this. It's just as outrage, outraged as the prophet, only it's done with a certain different, different sensibility because it's more policy-oriented than it is just simply an expression of outrage and a prediction of destruction. But at heart, both of them have this question. And I think it's a really good question. And it's a political question, but it's not partisan. It's simply a political question, right? The evils of a society, the evils of inequality, of poverty, the destruction of human beings, of human souls, through the, through the evils of inequality, right? That has to be seen as a religious problem. Now, what the solutions are, that's a political conversation, and that's open to debate. But what's not open to debate is our sense of responsibility for what we're doing to people by putting them in positions of impossible, impossible existence. Just poverty, destruction, degradation, the impossibility of that. What are we doing to the sanctity of human persons? And then finally, the most biggest question is, and what is that doing to us? When you can live in a city with 49,000 homeless people and learn not to see them, what has happened to you? And as much as we worry about the systemic poverty of the children, of the poor, what about the systemic wealth and inequality of our children? What happens to them? That's going to be the question. Yeah, Bobby and then Pop, and then we're going to go get lunch. See, I, I think you're saying, what, is, what does it do to us? Yeah. We, we see those people. We don't, we turn our eyes. When I get off the freeway and there's somebody there, I see them. And I turn away, and I know I'm turning away. So it's... It's, what does it do to me to know that I made that decision right. to turn away? And what's, and what's going to happen, though, is, well, your kids are grown, but, but when you have grandkids, soon, God willing, on main cella, right? Yes. They won't see them anymore. You don't I? No, they won't see them anymore because they're part of the urban landscape. And that's the, that's the question that the priests and the prophets are asking here. And what does that do to you? What does that do when you, when you can ignore fellow human beings and not see that they're fellow human beings. They just don't see them. In, they become socially invisible. This, the, the phenomenon of social invisibility. That's, that's going to be, that's, the, that's a, a, a different species of degradation. Pop, you get the last you comment. mention Akiba and the Pro's book? Akiba and the Pro's book. So Rabbi Akiba took, took these laws and he had to find a way around them. Because he was more worried about the remission of debts, which happens in the 50th year for the Levites, but in the seventh year for, the, for Deuteronomy. And if you have the remission of debts every seven years, right, no one's going to issue you a credit card. <laughs> right? I mean, that, that was, that's a fact. So what did Akiba do? He simply discovered a, a loophole in the law, that the law applies to personal debt but not corporate debt. <laughs> right? So what he did was, don't roll your eyes, that's true, right? So what he did was he corporatized all the debt in the seventh year you deposited your, de your, your debt with the court, and you could pick it up in the eighth year. That's how it worked. So he found a way around it. Because here's the problem. He, the rabbis resonated with the need, with the, with the problem, but they had to find a solution that was consistent with some sort of practicality. And if you destroy a monetary economy, then you haven't achieved anything. You haven't achieved anything. You know, you, if you destroy an economy, you say, no one will lend anybody else money. You're going to make it worse on the poor, not better. Right? If a, if a, if a farmer can't borrow money to buy seed to plant a crop, you're going, to, you're going to consign him to even worse poverty. So you had to figure out a practical solution to that problem. That's the problem. It's a great image. It's a great sermon. 
It's not a great policy. But the motivation of the policy is one of the greatest themes of the Bible. Let's stop there. Let's have a good Shabbos, everyone. Take good care.